at all these paparazzi. Did you hear the, did you hear got the Greg the, Hamilton the here. Protocols. Yeah. Got Eric Conover. Just say something sexy. Sexy. Thanks. Do something silly. Silly? Yeah. I wanted to say something sexy though. All right, what's your sexy thing? <laughs> something sexy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, say something nostalgic. Oh my gosh, it's like I've been here before, like... <sighs> Very good improv skills right there. <laughs> oh my god, it's... Man up! 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 Oliver Stone and Justin Gordon Levitt. I'm gonna be recording everyone who's recording them. Charlie Willock! I had no idea. Uh, I got more and more interested. I went to Moscow to meet him in uh, January of 2014. We deepened our conversations over the next months. I returned twice, and in June, uh, we started, my co writer, Kieran Fitzgerald, and I started working on the screenplay. And, uh, having talked to him and, got, and realized that he was cooperating, we were getting an inside story. This was very exciting. So, but we still hadn't solved how to do it. You know, it, was, it was a Rubik's Cube. Okay. Too much, a lot of technical, technical information, a lot of, but very little known, was known about his relationship with Lindsay, who becomes a factor in this, a very important factor. So that grew out of our talks. I ended up talking, went back nine times. I, I went to Moscow. Uh, Kieran went three times. But we ended up talking it out and getting a lot of details in, in bits and pieces. So we decided in the summer to go with a linear structure, basically. Start at the beginning, like like we did, like I did on Born on the Fourth of July in 1989, which is tell the story straight, not fractured, go with his beginnings as a soldier, as a young civilian uh, CIA man, and then so forth, lead to his first posting in, posting in Geneva, and then parallel that story with the Hong Kong story, which opens the film, and ends up in the climax being the, the release of the information. So we, and not to dwell on the escape or anything like that, but really to dwell on the first part of the story, how he became the man he did, and why. And Joseph, this is a, a, a man we've all seen in the news. Some people have seen him in a documentary. Is it harder to play somebody that's not only current, but it's still in the headlines and his story is changing every day? How do you prepare for that? Uh, of, uh, I wouldn't say it was harder. No, it, it gives you so much to go on. It's really inspiring. Um, and you know, my favorite performances usually are the actors who, who disappear into their characters. Where you, you don't see uh, that known person on the screen. You just see the, the person in the story. Um, and uh, when when I have uh, someone like Edward Snowden, who I can study, who I can listen to, uh, who I can even I, I went and, and physically met him. Uh, Oliver brought me on one of one of his trips to Moscow. Um, it gives me so much to go on to, to really create a character that's, that's different from myself. Uh, because that's, to me, that's what's so, um, one of the things that's so fun about acting is, is becoming someone different from yourself. He's quite a... What about the in between? Sure, Oliver wants Mons me to tell you guys a, another story about... Uh, <laughs> It was true. We you don't have to. No, hey, I'm happy to. We, when when Ed, when Ed and I first sat down, actually, uh, Lindsay was also in the room. Ed's longtime girlfriend, who Shay plays in the movie. Um, Oliver was there with us for the beginning of our meeting, and uh, and we immediately started talking about what interests Ed the most, which is you know international affairs and politics. And uh, and Oliver's like, don't talk about that. You can read about that. Ask him how he sleeps, how he eats. You know, um, you know, with his. Uh, quintessential grace. 
that he always brings to every situation. <laughs> and uh, but it, it's it's really true that um, I I could read about his positions and uh, understand him as a political figure, as so many people do. But but the the value in meeting him face to face was getting to observe those little nuances, how he walks or talks or eats or sleeps, uh, you know, how he shook hands. Um, I didn't observe how he sleeps, but I did observe how he, how he eats. Uh, yeah, he, and uh, you know, I, I really noticed that, um, the first thing I noticed was, I'm, I'm just taking Oliver's prompts, I'm going to keep telling him things that he likes to hear. Uh, that, um, you know, there's a, there's a stereotype that, that people who are good on computers are, are sort of socially awkward, and I was, I was half expecting that of him. Um, which uh, was really just me being guilty of the prejudice, uh, and it turned out not to really be the case. He's he's quite uh, old-fashioned in a way. Uh, you know, he's he's from North Carolina, where they put a lot of emphasis on on good manners, I think, or at least more so than they do where I'm from in, in Southern California. And um, yeah, he he really was a, a sort of a, a very graceful gentleman. And Shailene, in, in playing Lindsay. It's so much more than just the protagonist's role front. You know, it's it's our sort of way into seeing him as a fully formed character. I think. So, how did you did you get to talk to Lindsay? Did you read anything about her? How did you prepare to play her? Uh, I did get to talk to Lindsay, but not until three months into production. Oliver had met with Lindsay multiple times. Joe had met Lindsay. Kieran Fitzgerald, the co-writer, had as well, and so. I really trusted um, and valued their stories that they had to share about her and their observations of um, her personality and who she was, since I wasn't able to do that beforehand. And then she did have a pretty um, a wide range of past social media posts uh, predating 2013 that I sort of investigated and sifted through. Because she's a self-portrait photographer, there's a lot of her art online. Um, so a big part of it for me was trying to identify and capture this enthusiasm and this extroverted nature that she expressed through her art and through stories that they had shared, but also um, just try to keep it as grounded and truthful as possible without, um, without going too far into trying to 100% recreate who, actual, who Lindsay Mills actually is because I didn't have the opportunity to meet her. I think we're ready for the first question. You've already got a mic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Hans Morris from the German National Public Radio. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here and thank you for a great movie. I have two fold questions, uh, Mr. Stone. There's a line in the movie that irritated me which says, fighting terrorism is just an excuse for massive data collection. I thought that was a little bit overstated in the sense that terrorism is a real issue. We had it here in Europe, as you know, pretty bad. So intelligence agencies need information if they want to fight terrorist groups. So, but the real question, obviously, is how do you solve the interest of conflict between security and the privacy issue? A, a, a certain, uh, every citizen should have, and if I may add, there's another line where Ed Snowden is reflecting about the future, and I wondered if we have digital, digitalization big time and industry 4.0, which means a lot of robots are going to come in. Are we going to have so one the day? last question again. Yes. If we, about the future, yeah. if uh, we get robots coming in through industry 4.0, digitalization big time, does that mean that analysts will be or could be in the future robots, and we will have no Edward Snowden in the future at all. Thank you. Are you British? German. You're German. German. Well, you have a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I would think you share the British point of view on security at all costs. Uh, I fundamentally disagree with that view. And as the quote you mentioned, which is a very nice and good quote, came directly from Mr. Snowden in one of his newspaper articles. We took it from that. And he obviously believes that because he's been in that business and he's, what he's talking about is a huge waste of resources in tapping everybody, surveilling the entire population. You end up looking for a needle truly in a haystack, truly. And, and 
not only he, but Bill Binney shares that point of view. He worked there and he devised the, the original worldwide code called Thin Threat. That program was not used. It was like the Nicolas Cage character says in the movie, a, a cheap $3 million homegrown guerrilla type program and it worked. And that was thrown out in favor of a big, gigantic $3 billion project called Trailblazer, which ended up being used right after 9-11. And that too, Trailblazer has not shown any demonstrable evidence of results. And we keep asking, show us the results. We all believe in stopping terrorism. Terrorism is a threat. But like Reese Ifan says in the movie, the United States is behaving like the real threat is not ISIS, but the real threat is Russia, China, Iran. That's what they really seem to be thinking about. And they don't take this terrorism quite as seriously as you British or the as the Europeans do, and they should. And Mr. Putin takes terrorism very seriously too. So this is a debatable line, but we should have that debate. We should have that debate. And Snowden has called for it. He hoped the people would have it, and we have it. The security people keep telling us, we really know what's going on, but we have to do this for your own protection. For your own protection. Well, if that's true, and we all have to sign this agreement with the government, then give us some evidence of what you're doing. How do I know your system is really working? Because in 9-11, the whole thing broke down. The information from the NSA, which is supposed to pick up all the signals around the world, correct, in, the, in 1999, completely goofed it. They didn't even follow the bin Laden signals to the house, safe house in Yemen, in Sana, which they had. They had the phone number and everything. And they sent agents to, uh, two of those people that passed through there ended up in San Diego as hijackers living there. Never picked up, never passed on to the FBI. FBI, if you want to go to the 9-11 Commission, and that's just the surface, is a bundle of error. A bundle of error, as is. And the CIA did do better, but frankly, they didn't get through to the precedent. So, you know, let's not talk about overdoing it. Let's do our job correctly. Let's do the detective work that's required. Most of the information on terrorist actions, it's a limited group of people. And they, t they, tend, to, uh, they tend to communicate, and when they do, we, we people in, in our countries get leads. We're very good at this. Britain, Germany, you fought terrorists back in the 1970s, 60s, 80s, it was in Germany especially, in Britain, the IRA. We've been through this before. All of a sudden, all, we have to change all the ground rules because this is an emergency according to George Bush, and you're either with us or against us. This is not a solution. This is illogical and hysterical and overreaction. But the other question I completely don't understand. Maybe <laughs> can someone interpret the question? I think he wants an answer. Something about if robots, if robots came and then you don't have humans who might yeah, robots. Control. Robots what? Robots would be controlling all the information, so you can't have human error. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, you think so? Okay. I hope so. I hope you're right. The Germans are crazy about time. Right? They, it takes 43 minutes to get from the home to the to the office, right? Or 52 minutes, and then. This driverless car averages out to be actually 55 minutes because it's all ordered traffic and you're not allowed to speed and overtake. You're not allowed to cut through lanes like a lot of my friends in Germany like to do. So here we go with the driverless car society. It won't work. I don't think so. I think somebody's going to want to break out or else become a robot, an automated person. You'll feel like a robot. I guess I'm just questioning about how good robots are until we really, really, uh, and why would they replace us anyway? Why do you want to, why are you in such a rush? Do you think that's going to solve terrorism? <laughs> don't you think terrorism is a human criminal, criminal activity? I don't know. I don't think I understand the question. Anybody know? <laughs> Let's go. go ahead. Let's go ahead. Okay, we've got a, another question from the lady there. Thank you. Greta um, Klassen, German movie magazine. I've got two questions to Joseph. Um, what did you think first uh, when you heard about um, Edward Snowden's surveillance revelation? My hearing must not be good today. I'm sorry. I'm just a little tired. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, um, sorry, I didn't quite understand it. Okay. Um, so, what did you think first when you heard about Edward Snowden's surveillance revelation? Ah. Uh, well, um, I, I have to be completely honest that in 2013, uh, when when it first happened, uh, I really didn't pay very much attention to it, um, if I'm honest. Uh, and um, it wasn't until a year later when, when Oliver offered me this job. Uh, and I remember feeling very excited that Oliver had offered me a job because I'm such a fan of his movies. Um, but my next thought was, okay, wait, Edward Snowden, I know I've heard that name somewhere. 
well, which one's he and what exactly did he do? And I, I realized I didn't know any of the specifics. You know, you hear so much news. Uh, I know I'm guilty of this. I, I only rarely take the time to look in depth at something. And um, I think this is the case for a lot of us with, with a story like Edward Snowden. We've kind of heard something about it, but we don't really know very many of the details. Uh, that was me. And, uh, and, and once Oliver offered me this job, then, uh, then I really looked into it for myself and uh, I had a lot of learning to do. And uh, at that point, um, after you know, spending some hours on it, uh, I, uh, I came to feel very honored that he would offer me to, to play this role and, and, um, and to, to help tell the story. And now some people uh, see Snowden as a hero, others as a traitor. What do you think? Well, the first thing I would say to that question is uh, I, I wouldn't tell anybody to take my word for it. You know, like I just said, it's, it's sort of a complicated story, and I think a lot of people oversimplify it, and uh, I would encourage anyone who's interested to kind of find out for themselves. I can tell you my personal opinion, which is uh, that, you know, I, I understand why people call him a criminal. That's because he broke the law when he took classified documents and, and delivered them to journalists. Um, but the NSA was also breaking the law. Uh, and they were doing it all the time, every day, in a, in a really drastic way. And, and this is a law that's very important. It's in our Bill of Rights. It's the Fourth Amendment of our Constitution. And um, they were also lying about breaking that law. You know, uh, one of the stories that really sucked me in was uh, the story of this congressional hearing that took place just a few months before Snowden made his disclosures, where the director of national intelligence, James Clapper, he got up on the stand in front of Congress and swore to tell the truth, and he was asked, is the NSA collecting millions of records on American citizens? And he said no. It was just an outright lie. Uh, but no one could prove that he was lying until Snowden provided that proof to journalists. Um, so, uh, so ultimately, I'm, I'm grateful for what he did. Safe Magazine is online space magazine for young people. Um, first of all, congr congratulations on the movie. It was really, really thrilling. And um, I saw the documentary on season four. So uh, my <coughs> first question is, um, how, how much were you inspired by the three people filming David Snowden, the, the woman, the director who did the documentary, and the two um, guys from Guardian? And did they, do you also sp uh, spoke to them? And how was this um, working with them? And then a question for Joseph and Jenny. Uh, would you maybe um, work together again in a Scott Nightdale based script? <laughs> <laughs> she asked if we would work together in, in, a, in, a, in another script by Weber and Newstetter because he wrote, oh, they wrote oh, 500 Days of Summer. Yeah, yeah. And they wrote, uh, <laughs> Newstetter and Weber, they're two guys. Uh, they wrote um, Spectacular Now, right? And Faulkner's. And Faulkner's, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so that's um, not really an answer to that question. <laughs> I, see what you did. Uh, I would love to work with Shay again. It was a real, real pleasure working with her. I think she's a fantastic actress, and everything she does just feels honest to me. Thanks, Joe. I feel the same way about you, and I would love to work in a film Because <laughs> <laughs> he's an amazing director. If you guys haven't seen Don John, you got to check that film. And the first question? Uh, Laura, Laura Poitras. Uh, Laura Poitras and the Grand Bell Laura Poitras. Greenwald. Greenwald. What yeah. the influence was. I'll there. answer there. Paul, you wake up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching you up and down. Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, uh, Ed, Ed suggested we, uh, we, we, we go see her in Berlin. Uh, Moritz and I, Moritz Borman and I went there. We had, I had met her personally in the, at the Las Vegas Convention, the Las Vegas Convention for Hackers in 2012, which was actually a crucial convention. Is when Keith Alexander showed up there. He was at the NSA, and he was recruiting for the uh, NSA. He was, he was picking out the best minds he could find and getting them to work for the Pentagon. It's interesting because the anonymous group was there, so there was a, you know complete opposites. And uh, Alexander, who was a major general, and wears his stars in front of the committees, was wearing civilian clothes trying to be the nice guy, human guy, but they didn't trust him. And there was interesting, it was a board game, a chess, just an anecdote, a chess board game between the hackers and the military guys. And the military guys were wiped out by the hackers, truly. It was like 10 games were going on at the same time. Hacker, uh, but at that convention, with all the stars of this business, you know, the Bill Binnies, and, uh, 
uh, Tom Gray, uh, and uh, Laura had done two very fine documentaries. She was doing this movie. We went back to see her. She had very paranoid about anything at, at that point, and she she wouldn't show us any footage. We, we asked her to show some footage. And she didn't want to, which would have helped us with because you know she, she, we're all on Snowden's side of this affair. So uh, anyway. Uh, Glenn was uh, much more helpful, uh, safe in contact, and I had met him before too. He was very kind uh, and very supportive. Uh, and he writes the most intelligent stuff about, from The Intercept, he writes the most intelligent stuff about this problem. And it's a severe problem of people not understanding what happened and what information was. They really don't know. They don't really follow it. And I, I understand why. It's complicated and it's not easy to understand. But he's done a good job of explaining it in The Intercept along with many other people at that magazine. I suggest people in Germany should be aware of Intercept. It's very important to the survival of uh, some kind of contradiction to the NSA, which is very hard to do when you don't have the facts sometimes. And they don't, and how can we trust them? You know, that comes back to that essential thing. So uh, we, and the question goes on and on, and the answer goes, drifts into, yes, uh, they were, and you and you and McCaskill from the Guardian was there, and I talked to him as well. He was very helpful, as well as the editor of the Guardian, the woman played by Joy, Joy Lee Richardson in the movie, Janine Gibson was very helpful. And this was a big decision to print this. It, would, it could have cost everybody's career. They could have closed down the Guardian, which has a 200-year history. They could have, the British rules, the British laws allow for them to close up a, a, a anything they want in the name of the Official Secrets Act and so forth. That's something to maybe bring up that I think uh, doesn't get talked about enough that, that Oliver just brought up, that uh, that it was really the, these newspapers that made the decision to, of what exactly to publish. It's, it's a fact that's really worth repeating that you know, the number of documents that Edward Snowden delivered to the public is zero. Edward Snowden delivered documents to a very small select group of established and qualified journalists and said, I'm not deciding what goes to the public. You guys decide. Uh, you make the decision what's in the public interest to publish. Um, and, uh, I, I think that's actually really well dramatized in, um, in the script that, that Oliver and Kieran wrote. She doesn't look this way. I see, I see, there's 20 minutes. We're, we're going to go, I thought I was going to go next to the, okay, yes, go ahead. question is about consciousness. How is it related to the people who made the film and the audience as much as it is intended? Consciousness. 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 Sort of Freudian, though. Awareness, my awareness uh, grew uh, enormously. Uh, this is a world we all suspected that Bush was up to no good in the United States. I mean, it was it was even a story came out in 2004, five from James Risen, New York Times, about mass eavesdropping, illegal mass eavesdropping. That came out finally after a year and a half. It was spiked originally by the Times because it was a month before the presidential election, and Mr. Bush got the story spiked. So they, in the national interest, they buried that. Remember, in 1972, the New York Times published the Pentagon Papers. It's reason to be really outraged, because the Pentagon Papers cost them a lot of trial and effort, but they were actually applauding by the public for their heroism. But they didn't do that in 2004. Mr. Bush would have lost the election, to my belief, would have lost that election if those papers, if what reason had said had come out, and he had enough evidence but he got into trouble. They chased him. He, his, his career is practically ruined. We hope he's going to make a comeback. He's a good reporter, but you can't take on the national security state if you're a reporter. And when you talk to these people, you realize how scary it is for any reporter who's a serious investigator to go there. You get labeled, and not only that, now the government of the United States is so secretive that anybody who has lunch with, an, with a reporter, anybody who has lunch with him has to get permission from his superior office. Or you can see a person socially. It's a strange uh, new system of, uh, call it authoritarian government. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, your question is about my consciousness, their consciousness. To, uh, my, my consciousness went up as a result of this. That's uh, what I can say. Do you think 
shading and just do you think differently about privacy or, or any of these topics after making this film? <laughs> That's what a director does. <laughs> That's what a director does. <laughs> Directs in the press conference. <laughs> um, it's an interesting story, actually. What sort of story would you like me to tell? I knew about the story in 2013 when it broke because it greatly impacted my life. I was the last generation to not really use an iPhone in high school. My little brother's three years younger and he did grow up with an iPhone in high school and even just seeing the remarkable differences in a matter of three years between his generation and mine um, is profound. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that separate those two generations even though three years wouldn't normally be considered a generational gap because of technology. Um, so when the iPhone came out, there was always sort of like a suspicion, you know, the Orwellian theories and, and Big Brother, and they're watching us. And then when Ed revealed, uh, or I guess Ed, when the journalists revealed the information that Ed had disclosed to them, um, it validated a lot of suspicions that I had, and, and it didn't make me paranoid, but it made me, made me feel aware, and it made me feel empowered to um, look at technology a little bit differently. But I hadn't really taken any action, the steps that, that led to distinct action until I read the screenplay for this movie. And working on this project was phenomenal because I learned about the human, the humanity behind Edward Snowden, which is what this movie offers us. A lot of us have strong opinions about a man that we know very little about. Um, and our strong opinions are based off the perspectives and the narratives of mainstream media and our governments. But they, um, you know, they're not formulated or full formulated opinions because we didn't have the whole story and now we have a greater insight into the whole story. Um, I think Oliver was referring to maybe how polit my politics. <laughs> I, I was, yeah, I, you know, one thing that was really and is interesting to me, you know, in America we have this, it's our election year and I was a Bernie Sanders um, surrogate and traveled around with his campaign for since February of this year. but. He, in, in large, was um, one of the only presidential candidates who talked about Edward Snowden um, with, you know, with a, a point of, of reverence and um, really admired Ed, Ed and his courage and what he chose to do. And I, moving forward now with these two presidential candidates that we had, um, it's interesting as an American to sort of see how this story, even though it affects all citizens of the world, not just America, isn't being talked about largely, uh, and I guess in the debates moving forward, that will be a, a fascinating topic that I hope they bring up. Yeah. I hope they discuss. Yeah. I know there's questions over here. Somebody already has the mic there, so please. Hans Jörg Zinsle for Bernard Zeitung uh, about politics. Um, I don't know if you're aware that there's a uh, voting tomorrow in Switzerland uh, about. Uh, uh, giving permission by law to the National Intelligence Service to collect any data from uh, everybody in order to protect freedom and security. So uh, it looks like the predictions are like a 60% yes. What's your advice to the Swiss people? <laughs> <laughs> well, most people will go with their government unless they're an open revolt. It just it makes sense. The governments keep repeating it, repeating it, terror, terrorism, fear, fear, and they need more laws to catch these people. That's not in evidence. It, it has not been shown to be true. It's, sometimes it's shown to be the opposite. The more information they get, the less they see. They need to get specific targeted information. But you people will, I mean, everyone will vote in the direction of more security, which is insanity. You know, don't forget that the, the Nazis offered the same deal in the early 1930s. And when they took power in 1933, I believe it was called Special Order Number 48, in which they said the same thing. We have to protect you. We must protect Germany. And in return, well, you saw what happened. So in return, you're going to get more security. That's what you think. As I said earlier, this gentleman, I don't believe it. But may I just add, uh, I think it's wonderful it's being voted on. <laughs> that's that's what, you know, well, and yes, but that, that's exactly what didn't happen in the United States, and that's what should be happening. So, uh, you know, 
whether or not mass surveillance is, is right or wrong, that's a complicated issue. Um, I, I tend to agree with Oliver, I'd like to see any evidence, uh, because the, the truth is if, if there, there hasn't been any, uh, any um, situations where a, a terrorist plot has been thwarted by these mass surveillance programs. In fact, Keith Alexander, who you mentioned earlier, at one point claimed that there had been, I think, 54 cases of terrorism uh, that had been thwarted by these mass surveillance programs and was later shown to be lying and had to publicly admit that he was lying about that. Um, so, and, and this is actually one thing that I, I learned that I didn't understand before really spending time to uh, get into this story. There's a difference between mass surveillance and targeted surveillance. So targeted surveillance is when they have uh, you know, suspicion that a particular individual might be committing a crime and they get a warrant. Uh, which is, that's what's mandated in our constitution anyway, and, uh, and then they can conduct surveillance on that individual who they suspect. That's targeted surveillance. Mass surveillance is when they just collect information about everybody all the time, and that's not, uh, that's not legal, at least in our, in our constitution. But, again, if, if the people want to vote for it and, and think that that's right, that at least is is following democracy, and, and uh, uh, you know I I, uh, I think that's that's what should have happened in the United States. Um, is there a mic on this side? Can I get a question if you want to? Oh, okay. Or stand up and shout. Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> so, it's uh, it's Christian Aust, a German freelance film journalist. Another German question, less Freudian. It goes to Oliver Stone. Um, you always do movies your way, and you never take the easy way, and you never sold out, you never mellowed down. Um, I want, would like to know where you take the courage, the inspiration, the balls, if you like, to make movies your way, and still always to go against the grain. Well, in this case, it, it's just the way I am. I, 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 I don't like lies. I feel very strongly about lying. And when governments do it, and they all do, but the bigger the lie, more dangerous. And in the United States case, we have a lot of lying, a lot of lying has been going on since World War II especially. About every war we're in, we get a false story, we get a false narrative, and our newspapers lead the charge, the media leads the charge, and we get into another mess, screw up more of the world, and it's just getting very messy now. This is the result. So uh, lies hurt. Lies can be the most dangerous thing in a society. It just we're not informed. We don't, we're a citizenry that is not informed. Although it's, it's an ideal situation, let's have a democracy. But we should be informed if we're going to have a democracy. They won't trust us with anything. Everything is national security now. So uh, the anger comes from that. And my, you know, my parents got divorced when I was 16. I thought they were a perfect couple. Uh, I found out afterward that there was a lot of things going on behind the scenes that were much more uh, shocking and realistic in, about life. And you can say that comes from there, maybe, or who knows. But certainly, you get lied to a lot as an infant. Think about all the lies your parents tell you. We're getting back to Freud now. From Santa Claus. From Santa Claus. Who is Santa Claus? Santa Claus becomes God, in a way, right? Uh, so uh, all I'm saying is that there's a basic, it's not about Vietnam. It was about the, some fundamental lies that the governments keep telling. It gets me a pissed off, no matter how old I am. I, I still get worked up. I start talking back to the newspaper when they sell me some bill of goods uh, that I've heard before and before and before, and I know is a lie. So here we are, and uh, that's what we're, that's what motivates me. Okay, I'm afraid we're out of time. Oh, so no. I'm no. speak. <laughs> one last, maybe one last one. No, I'm yeah, sorry. One more. Come on. Wendy. One more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. One more. Saying yes. Okay. This Thank man you. has been very patient. <laughs> Do you, do you think you're... Uh, uh, can you tell us uh, where you're from? Yes. Uh, Hans Schwitzeler Freelance. Dodge is my name. I just want to, first of all, great movie. Thank you. I saw it this morning and I really enjoyed it a lot. But do you think your movie will have any effect for this pardon by the, this president or maybe the next president? Movies are, you know, in the United States, it's funny, the movie barely comes out and already they keep on news shows they... Pardon or no pardon, hero or traitor. This is where they're jumping to conclusions, and no one in the audience has seen the film. So it's it's really kind of self-defeating because we want quick answers. This is the nature of our society. 
It's not quick answers are not the answer. We have to think. We have to pause, breathe, see the movie first, and then maybe you'll come to a, a different conclusion about whether you should be pardoned or not. So that's what I have to say about that. And I just, well, I miss the 1970s Antonioni kind of press conferences when everybody broke out calling out and there were no rules and, and everybody was screaming. I kind of miss that. Everybody's so ordered now. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thanks for great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of you.